Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 81, and our book is the long-awaited Vaults of Terra 3, The Dark City. The book is by Chris Raitt, and it tells the conclusion of Spinoza and Crowell's adventures in Terran politics. Guess is how I would describe that. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Big spoiler warning. If you have not yet read this book, definitely check out the book and then come back to this episode as we're going to be discussing it from start to finish in great detail. And I feel like if you're a Vaults of Terra fan, you will do yourself a disservice if you listen to this before reading. Oh, yeah. With that, let's dive in. So, um, did you like the book? I did. I loved it. It was, it was... Very sad, but it was what I was it was what I was waiting for and hoping for. I didn't see the ending coming. Not like that. No. Um, I saw one piece, one piece, because we knew from book one that uh, that Krell's yeah. time was very limited. Hmm. But uh, well, yeah, I feel like we knew that some of the play the pieces were in play. So, like, the final actors and pieces I wasn't super surprised about, but the what is going on here, I did not see at all. So, kudos, again, I always say that Chris Raid is one of my favorite authors in the Black Library because he does, like, a, a, a kin of magic tricks, right? <laughs> Where he gets to the end and then he's like, ta-da, it was really a fish the entire time. Um, he did very well this time as well. Um, So, what part stood out to you? Oh, man, so much. So much. So much stood out to me. Basically, there's just so many great, like, insight stuff uh, just with the whole world. And, like, one quote I wrote down was, The Imperium wasn't a place where mysteries were investigated. They were accepted, turned into truths that couldn't be questioned, slotted into the realm of of the actual as life went on around them. Like, yeah. Yeah. They, it is a society that does not encourage inquisitiveness. Um, because, I mean, one of the, like, the long standing phrases is that, like, um, oh my God, they said this like a thousand times in Dawn of War, and now I can't even think of what it was, but like, an empty mind is a safe mind or something like that, right? Like, you just don't question what's going on because if you can't explain it, yes, just accept it don't question because you're not going to want the answers and you're not going to want other people to know you have the answers. Um, And as the intro always says, so much has been lost. Well, that I wrote down like this page. And basically this is like, not just for um, Terran politics. That's page 86. It's, I think it's like just politics in general and, and, and uh, the second millennia. Uh, yet again, Kral's jaded vision had proved closer to the mark, even now. Now, with every conceivable system failing, the great and the powerful were still scrambling to cover their backs, to snuff out inconvenient truths, to jockey and jostle for position. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I was right, because the sentence before that, she talked about that um, she still wanted things to be the way she'd always believed them to be competent, efficient, dedicated eternally to the eternal glory of the Imperium. Isn't that like how we all are? Like, we just all believe that, you know, everything's just going peachy keen. Like, the government knows what, what it's doing. And it's just, you know, when you have that moment where the scales come from your eyes type thing, and you realize, oh, my God, this is just awful. Well, and, like, when she talks about how she always thought, like, the best and brightest and most competent were the High Lords of Terra. And I loved when she says it to Diaz, and he looks at her and he's like, really? Like, oh, bless your sweet summer heart. And she's like, yeah. It's, despite the fact that she's an interrogator, and we'll talk a lot more about Spinoza in a second, but despite the fact that she's an interrogator, I always liked that there was this kind of naivete about her and this innocence about her. Um, She's an interrogator. She does bad things. She knows more than the average Joe. And yet, she still wanted to believe that the High Lords are just acting in glory service to the throne. (laughs) 
Bless you know, that's heart. one thing I'll say about Chris right between this and the um, Watchers of the Throne. He's pretty much shown that the High Lords of Terra are out for only one interest, and that's their own. Their own interests, right? I mean, it's not even it the in, by bureaucracy. Like, not even the interest of what they're representing. You know? Right. <laughs> it's literally their own interest. Yeah. Um, and we'll unpack that a little bit more later, but yeah, it's it's a little again, it's death by bureaucracy, right? It's we see it like you see it in everything from like the mega core that mm -hmm. you work for to like governments of the world, right? Like just it, eventually it just bloats. And I think of a lot of um, when we read Fabius Bile, I got really irritated with the way that they constantly said the center cannot hold. But I feel like after reading a lot of Chris Rates books where he dives into the Terran politics, I'm starting to kind of be like, mm, yeah, the center cannot hold. <laughs> this is... I... It's held together by masking tape and wishes. Oh my god, and like chewing gum in a random paperclip mm -hmm. that somebody found. One of the scenes that stood out the most to me that I loved and I bookmarked it, so it just it made me so happy. It's when... Gor when you finally get to see a chapter from Gorgias's perspective. And the first thing is that he refers to Crowl as his apprentice. I love that. And Spinoza as that woman. And he can't, he, there's not enough of him left because he's like, well, she was angry, very angry. And I love when he reveals that in his mind, he's like, affirmative. That would appear to be the most prudent course of action. But what comes out is affirmativo, yes, yes, optima best, agenda, prudence. It's like this weird toddler pigeon speak. And I mm -hmm. just, the whole idea of a servo skull retaining some of its sentience, it's, and I was really surprised when Ziaz was like, oh, this one still has some sentience in it. Bruh. And he's kind of cool with it. <laughs> it's kind of creepy, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but. I wasn't that the whole thing with the bookkeeper's skull as well? Right. Um, but goddamn you, Chris Rate, for giving me feels about a servo skull. At the end of the book, I was like, somebody needs to find him. Before he gets stepped on by a carnosaur. And then, of course, and I think everybody knows that Chris Rate put this in there just for me. Um, when Kazad is like, uh, to, uh, toward the end of the book, when she's talking with, um, with Revis, and she's like, I have just one thing to say to you now. Oh, yeah. Our and children like, would have been wonderful or something like that. Our children would have been formidable. Yes, they would have been. <laughs> and then they get killed. Everybody gets killed. Like, again, I didn't see that coming. I certainly did not. Now, having said that, given that this book essentially takes place before the events of Watchers of the Throne, during and after, it makes a lot of sense. Like, once once I figured out the way that it... When um, Navardaran gets up there and he's just like... Yeah, um, the ancient enemy was on Terra. I do like how he cryptically is like, a name from history long forgotten has returned. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. oh no, this is Watchers of the Throne. Well, and the thing is when they said they were going to Luna, I was like, isn't that where Raboot showed up first? Was Luna? So I thought, that, I thought he was going to appear there and he was, that he was going to be a part of this and I was kind of disappointed that he wasn't. But, um... I kind of was too, but I also thought it was interesting that in the pursuit of this one thread, and I'm not saying that it wasn't important, but it was one thread, you, you miss the Primarch coming back. Like, the biggest event in Warhammer 40k history mm -hmm. easily in the past centuries for these people, right? That, and you, yeah. you they just cross like ships. Well, I mean, he was part of destroying the portal. I was like, dude, you didn't even look to see what was back there. <laughs> oh, I, I think she was dead before the portal got... I'm not... I, I don't know. 
Because remember, she says she feels that pain and she feels herself being dragged. And you're like, you fucking bitches. The Jukari. Sorry. Excuse my language. Yeah. The uh, um, No. So like the way that um, the other Inquisitor, I never knew how to pronounce his name. I always said Ziaz, but I don't know if I'm sure. Yeah. It was easiest. Uh, the Z guy. Like, how he went was just so awful. Like, it, just being, you know, and I even dragged begr- by, like, little demons, essentially. I begrudgingly liked him at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Begrudgingly. Like. Yeah, when everything kind of came together and he was just like, this is, this is so bullshit. This is nuts. <laughs> what is going on? Like, his reaction, I kind of felt like, so, you know. One of the things that really works in successful science fiction novels is you typically have to have, like, the fish out of water or the everyman character. And I'm not about to claim that an Inquisitor is either of those things. But he really did serve that purpose, right? Of being the guy who's like, I have no idea what's going on and what you're talking about. I was just told to bring you to ARCs. Like, that's all I care about. You know, he kind of reminded, right. you know, reminded me of was like Tommy Lee Jones and The Fugitive. It's like, I didn't kill right. my wife. I don't care. I don't care. My job is to bring you but bring you back and bring you before. He had no interest. But then as he's being forced in the situation, like Tommy Lee Jones' character, then stuff gets, you know, unraveled. He's just like, exactly. damn. And okay. then at the end, he's forced to be like, okay. Like, this is a thing, and now we're, now we're gonna, now we're part of this. Um, I really did like his character. I did, and that was another part that stood out to me, is that in the beginning, I was like, mm-hmm, this is the villain. I don't like this guy. And then, like, as it keeps progressing, you're like, well, I guess, okay, he's not so bad. He's just an Inquisitor. And then by the end, yeah. Just I doing his job. Sad. He's not a villain. He was just doing his job. It, mm-hmm. it kind of seemed like maybe he was trying to cover up. Like, it was just because you, that's the problem with the Inquisition, right? You don't know what side anybody is on. And you don't know if they're trying no. to cover up something. If they were in on this whole thing, if they were on Frank's side, you know, were they on this side? It's hard to trust anybody. Were, were they possibly part of the attack mm-hmm. on the Corvain? Exactly. And, like, and Arcs, I, I remember that Arcs was one of the good ones. From Watchers of the Throne to Electric Boogaloo, but, like, she was one of the good ones in that she wasn't actively working against Robbie Bobby. Right. That necessarily means she's one of the good ones? Or was she just well, not I mean, as in bad? in terms of Inquisitors, yeah. Right? <laughs> like, I don't know. I, it, but even she, like, at the end of the book, right? She's just... All right, I guess we're not going to know what happened there. And let's, I mean, keep digging, but all right. Like, she wasn't oh, curses, foiled, and just, all right, I tried to figure it out and still have a mystery on my hands, which I don't like mysteries. Yeah, but she she was still, like, thinking that her Inquisitor was still alive. Like, she's like, keep looking for him. It's the part that makes me so sad. All Not that these people, like... Not that Spinoza and Crowell and Rivas and Kazad had, like, all of these people back waiting for them. And not that I'm saying, like, Ziaz and Arcs had this great connection, but, like, people just disappeared. Mm-hmm. And they'll, they'll never really know. I mean, they'll make some assumptions, but they're not going to know what happened. Not unless she picks Again, up the skull. Another mystery. So, let's... So, how did you... So, I feel like in this book, right... Crowl's in this book, but this book is really about Spinoza. It is Spinoza's story. Mm-hmm. How did you feel about her versus Crowl as an Inquisitor? And would she have made a good Inquisitor? Uh, you know, no. no. I, I I think that Zia's was, was right. That um, she lacks the imagination to be an Inquisitor. She was just, you know, she's like the dragnet Inquisitor. Just the facts, ma'am. You know, just I'm following orders. I'm just, you know, doing doing this and doing that, but not wasn't creative enough to like to do the outside investigation because really her whole thing was was to find Crowell like she wasn't entirely interested in what he was doing because she's like he's just gone mad and I think that this that there's really that he's just nuts and uh none of this is what's really going on it's not until she gets there that she sees he's right all along and holy crap this is worse than I imagined because she lacked that imagination which I think just comes with 
you know, years of being in the Inquisition and just seeing a whole bunch of shit, <laughs> to be honest. Right. Well, I think she started there. But, like, even at the end when he was like, okay, I was wrong about you. I was like, you weren't wrong about her in the beginning. But it's that moment when they're, when she figures out that she's like, oh, God, it's Luna. It's that moment where I was like, okay, now you have stepped up. Because even Crowell was like, oh, yeah, she's actually quite good, isn't she? Like, I feel like she had enough experience. Nobody saw that ending coming. Right. Right. Um, I feel like she might have been able to grow into something really great. But you're right. Like, in the beginning of the book, like, when she's having to tell herself, like, when she was talking with Anila, right? And all of a sudden, she's like, wait, you have a daughter, right? Because she's like, I forgot that Crowell asked about people. So, but she's even doing it, like, not, like, naturally. Like, right. Like, hey, how's your daughter doing it's She's, more of like it's more oh, like this is what i should be doing it reminded me of that scene um oh i can't remember what book it is i can't remember what book that is with the iron with the uh imperial fist primaris warrior when the human's just kind of like trying to like chit chat with him and he's oh, like, right i'm gonna kill the shit out of this small talk and then like <laughs> he's like oh he's he trying to small talk to like he wasn't feeling it right he was just doing like going through the motions and I felt like that was kind of her too. Like, okay, now I've asked about her child. Cause she even says, she's like, okay, I need you to go now. We're done. This is awkward now. She didn't quite have that human, which is always one of the things about Crowl. And I feel like they really emphasize this in this book. He was an inquisitor. He was not to be messed with. He was a very serious person, but he did care mm -hmm. about the people in his retinue. He cared about Kazad. He cared about Revis. Certainly cared about Hagen and Anila. Who are still alive. They are. Because they With didn't. the rogue traitor. Yep, they didn't make it into the portal. Well, that's going to be an interesting conversation. Then they get back to the rogue traitors. So, funny story. Here's your guy. The Palantine Sentinels. Tried to arrest us. The rogue trader just like, meh, sure. <laughs> I did like that the rogue trader ended up ultimately being somewhat inconsequential to the plot. Like, she gave some information mm -hmm. that helped Spinoza, but, like, it was one of those things, like, at the end where she's like, and I'm here to save everyone. Or you can't touch that person. I'm friends with them. Nope. She just served her purpose and mm -hmm. then was gone. I feel like we're, you know my feelings on rogue traders. I was an inquisitor all along. <laughs> no, she was legit just a very strange. Yeah. As they all are. You, right, well, yeah. Usually when you're, like, carting Inquisitors around, I think that happens to you. Right. Um, but I I really, I think, I, I've always liked Spinoza as a character, but I really, it was a much more fun to watch her really cast off, like, those shackles of naivete and be like, oh, this is happening, and this is all very bad. Mm -hmm. She was still mournful of it, like, because I think she kind of recognized, like, oh, welp. Why, oh, why didn't I take the blue pill? <laughs> That's what she was asking herself in that moment. How did you feel about Crowell in this book? Because, I mean, he doesn't even make an appearance until, what, after the half? The first half? I would say, like, after the, he, he's there in the last third. That's what I would say. Yeah, about that. Um, I don't know. Um, I felt bad for him. Um, but at the same time, I... I appreciate that he recognized the Xenos madness that was going in him. You know, he's like, yes, I know how to do these things. Don't ask me how I know them. I don't know how I know them. I, I just do. You know, how he's able to, you know, get through the webway. You know, when he explains why he, like, broke all the mirrors. And even then, um, Spinoza was just like, okay, you're crazy. But, you know, like. You're just nuts. Like, that can't really happen. And then he actually goes through one of the mirrors. And, like, no, I mean, it's kind of known with elvish lore that they have a thing with mirrors and mirror magic. I never really like it very much because I think it's overdone. But I think it's just because it's just kind of part of elven lore. You see it everywhere. How it's in freaking Dragon Age. Alluvians. Uh, yes. But, uh, but, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, but I was glad to see that he was not crazy, in a way. That he, you know, uh, because really at the end of the Hollow Mountain, like, you really kind of didn't know, like, like how he, what happened with Frank. Like, 
did you really go overboard with that? The, was, was this really necessary? Oh no, it turns out it totally was. He's just hundred percent. He's just not very good at, at at explaining himself. And think the fact that he had that Xenos influence kind of going on him didn't help anything. It made people not really trust him as much. It was. But I was happy I that was... the custodian showed up, and they were like, "Yep, we're here." I liked and respected that even the mechanicus was kind of like a little wary about the custodian, right? The inquisitors, they don't care. They're just like, you have no authority here. But the custodians, they still kind of were even they, they still had the you don't technically have authority over us, but we recognize you're a big deal and we probably should be a little more polite to you. Yeah, you like, guys are kind of like the big authority on the throne. Yeah, we were like, I mean, he even, Raskian even refers to him later as the Omnissiah. So I liked that Navardaran showed up. I like that he's kind of looking at Kral a little askance, right? That everybody's, look, and it, to your earlier point, it made me very sad as well. Because you have this man, this great Inquisitor who's been for so long, and you just see him in this broken shell the scene where he's talking with the homunculi was both very fascinating. I especially loved the thing with Bach when he's just like, oh, you guys peaked millennia ago. I was like, oh, that's way harsh, Ty. That was rude. Um, but also, it just made me so sad I liked to know that Kral was ultimately in control of himself in that conversation. Mm -hmm. was gleaning information and still being an Inquisitor. To an earlier conversation, vis-a-vis -vis the imagination, I'm not necessarily sure. Like, he starts picking up on what's relevant and what's important here, right? Partially because he has that Xenos connection, but partially because he's just a smart Inquisitor. I don't know that Spinoza would have made the same connections. She might have with S experience, but... So yeah, Zeno's know. connection or no, I don't know that she would have made those same connections. And um, I liked to know that he wasn't just this raving lunatic who was falling apart. I mean, he was those things, but he did still have his inquisitorial self in mm -hmm. there. Um, were you invested in Spinoza and Kral's entourage, this book? I feel like we got to see a little bit, like, we got to see actually quite a bit of them, Kazad and Revis especially. I was, in, I was invested in I was invested in Kazad. Like I, I really mm -hmm. I really liked you know, especially because she was kind of the um, anomaly in the matter. Like right. didn't exactly weren't exactly sure like which side she was going she was going to go and um, and even when um, she had summoned Spinoza to her on behalf of Zeus, I was like I can see this going either way, and I really don't know which way it's going to go. I thought that was very, very I, well done. I had the same thought because they had established her as being so neutral, like mm -hmm. true neutral character that I was like, she, she could go either way. Like she might fully be like, look, Spinoza, I need you to take a chill and listen to this guy. Or could have been like, not my circus, not my monkeys. You betrayed, betrayed Crowl in her mind um, or what happened. And I, I was actually really relieved. Yeah, like, I was too. Said, when she gave the warning and then she launches like that attack against Ziaz's guys, I did have a moment of, oh, thank God. She's like, do you have anything you want to say? I do. Echo nine. <laughs> and then explosions. Oh my God. And Spinoza's <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Um, and I liked that Spinoza never like was like, oh yeah, I can trust this person implicitly. Even she, I mean, she had enough experience to be like, I don't know about this one. Right. Might trustworthy she might not be um obviously i loved the whole her and revis's relationship kind of growing there out of mutual respect and recognizing that each other was very very dangerous um i was emotionally invested in that and then gorgeous the skull why i always found him very humorous oh, and yeah. i always liked but now i'm emotionally invested in this dang thing how does that happen? You were worried that she actually killed him. Oh, my God. I just had this feeling. I was like, mm, 
that's just too simple of an explanation. When they showed up and they were like, oh, there's a smashed servo skull and organic matter. Oh, I don't think she killed him. And sure enough, because he's too delightful of a character. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. I, I thought that they were, I thought he did a really great thing with them though in this book. They were, there was a good counterbalance, right? Where like, I kind of knew nobody was making it out alive when when Revis and Kazad really started having that like mutual affection for each other. As soon as he started focusing on that, I was like, oh, they're not making it out alive. Um, I had hope. I had hope as well. Like, I really but, thought that Spinoza was going to make it out. I thought for sure Spinoza was going to. Like, I thought, and I wasn't in even, my mind... I wasn't even that sure until the very end when um, when Ark stepped over the skull. <laughs> you know, just uh, the, the skull that was, like, in the gutter. And, like, she couldn't hear what it was saying. She's like, no, oh, okay, just kept on going. I was like, shit, they all died? Like, no. <laughs> This is not acceptable. Uh, well, the service skull ends up on that other planet. Um, I, I thought it was... That, I have to reread that. That moment um, when she says she feels the pain in her legs. So in my mind, I was convinced that it was going to be a very tragic Warhammer 40k ending that like she was going to get out and somebody like Arx's people would be there to be like you're going to prison now. Like, we're bringing you in, and whatever you have to say, this is so heretical, we're never going to listen to you, basically. Like, I figured they were just going to, like, lock her up and throw away the key, and wouldn't that be horribly tragic and awful? Um, so, and I guess, in some ways, her dying was a better fate than that. I really thought that the custodians were going to break free. Figured if anybody they... could, it'd be them. Oh, my God. When they said that they heard that loud boom go off that took out Raskin I was like but they but the custodians got out right no oh dear that's also going to be a fun conversation right like I can just picture the custodians back on earth like we lost how many how many haven't come back that's not I mean I understand that there's 10,000 of them but that's not an insignificant amount mm -hmm. especially Please. for a faction that never leaves the palace like, that's a big deal. Um, and Chris Wright just, like, casually kills them. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not super casual. But, yeah, I had... See, they full-on rogue, so, rogue won to me. I remember at the end of Watchers of the Throne, we have... Um, what's her face? She's investigating that stuff on Luna. Like, what if? What if? Leia... That would actually kind of be awesome if in part of setting up Luna, she's like, oh, wait a minute. Now, I do know that they established that Gulliman broke the gate because he's like, this is some heresy. Right. Um, and he's not wrong. And it's probably for the best. But. But that doesn't mean there's not other. I mean, assuming they're evidence. alive, there's they're still just in the webway, you know, kind of like the um, all the space wolves and uh, Ashes of Prospero. They're just hanging on the webway. It's. Like a nightmare. Oh. Although I have some questions about that. Because the space wolves are hanging out in the webway and they get lost in there for 10,000 years. So allegedly, Jagatai Khan is lost in the webway because he's looking for stuff and things. Um, they seem to navigate it no problem. Now, granted, they don't go super deep into the webway. They right. basically walk in are received in this foyer and then... Right, but they also had Krell, who had this instinctive way of knowing where they needed to go because of the the Xenos problem in his head. Right. But they do try, I mean, they escape. Like, Spinoza gets to the gate. Mm-hmm. For all the good it did her. Like, so let, let's talk about one of the big cruxes here, the two big plot points. Um, first off, what did you think of Raskian's argument for why they were keeping this secret. Uh, you know, yes, I understand that you can't go to the council with that, but that's because it's a bad idea and it's stupid and you're stupid. 
Oh, man. So here's the part where I got so torn because I was like, I'm reading this aloud, right? And of course, I get to the point where Crowell is like, well, why didn't you bring this before the council? And my husband and I both were like, because ain't nobody got time for that. And then sure enough, when Raskin lays that out, I was like, he has a point, though. And now I reluctantly agree with this dick. However, to your point. With the Drakari? Had he gone to the council, maybe somebody who actually knew something about the Xenos would be like, okay, but those are the bad Eldari. We can't trust the bad Eldari. Like, you have to go to the good Eldari. You can't deal with the Drakari. These are not good people. Like, Raskian so clearly just thought an Eldari is an Eldari is an Eldari is an Eldari. Xenos is a Xenos. Who cares? Like, they're all the same people. Um... Yes, but also no. Right. Like, technically, are we the same people as the Canadians? Yes, but also no. There's some, <laughs> like, cultural differences. Um, same with the... Ca- and yes, the Canadians, the Jukari in this situation, clearly. Um, I think we're the Jukari. Um, Anyways, like, it's one of those things where, had you brought it before the council? Yeah, it would have gotten dogged down for probably a 50-year argument. Right, but maybe some other people would have had some expertise to lend. Right, and they're like, you know, maybe we should go talk to the like other Eldari. And I also, I low key think they were both right. Like, I think Raskian was correct in his assumption, but I also think Crowell wasn't too far off from the mark of, yeah, well, the throne is your purview, and you don't know how to fix it, and you don't want anyone to know that. Right. Oh, yeah. 100%. There's a little bit of truth there, right? Because that's one of the big cruxes of the Mechanicus is that none of them really know what they're doing. They don't really know how any of this works, but they're not going to admit that. And that was something that was actually talked about in Watchers of the Throne as as well. Uh, when mm-hmm. they were actually got to the throne room and um, he was noticing the Mechanicus like pretending to work on on stuff. He's like, they don't even know what they're doing. That's right. Like, they don't even know. Well, and I did like... Which is like, that was also, strange to me that the Emperor didn't have a manual. <laughs> oh, my God. That's all I could think of. Or maybe too. it was Malkador. Maybe Malkador was the manual. and Malkador, Malkador was the manual. And Malkador, you know. Well. Yeah, that didn't go so well. The other thing, like, another thing that's wholly possible... Is that because remember when they start going through like the schematics of the throne, which I always forget the scale of the throne. Because like, when you say a throne, you picture like a, a chair, um, but a chair for a really big dude. No, this thing, like when they were going through the scale of it. But all I could think about was like just the amount of jury rigging when they talk about like how, oh, there's like all of this mechanic stuff with lots of wires and coolant coils and all of this stuff. And then when they finally get to, like, the meat of the throne, they're like, oh, it suddenly becomes a little more elegant and clearly not Mechanicus in nature. They all, the Inquisitors all have a, wh- oh, I'm sorry, it's made by who? Like, ugh, moment. I mean. Is it possible? Uh, it's like, people didn't realize that the Emperor, you know, the greatest scientist of the time, he took things from uh, various technologies. One of the reasons that he was so great, and, and we really saw this in the great work, is he knew when to lean on other people's expertise. Yes. And sometimes that meant other cultures. Right. Like, the, um, what do you call it? The Calidus assassins, right? What's their number one weapon? A Necron phase blade. Like, the amount of just casual magpie theft Mm -hmm. that has gone on in the Imperium. But here's one of the things that I was really wrestling with. Is it possible that the Emperor did, like, 100% have a user manual? But somewhere, somewhere along the line was like, but this has Eldari runes in it, and that's Xenos, and this can't be real. That's also very possible. We talk about how much has been lost. How much has been lost due to willful... No, I don't like that. Well, I mean, that's the that's the Inquisition in general, right? Could have been the Inquisition. It could have been the Mechanicus. Could have the been. The Mechanicus maybe look at it and they're like, is it Eldari technology in my machinery? 
But I'm not sh- sure about that because I remember in um, Dark Imperium, like Reboot, he had to talk with the Mechanicus and be like, Will you please stop taking apart Xenos ships? Like, no, you're not supposed to be doing that. Was it a Primarch? Did a Primarch or a Space Marine get hold of it and was like, mm mm mm? Like, that's one of the crazy things about the scale of time we're talking about and just the nature of the Imperium that, yeah, such a thing could have existed. It could have been axed. Or, you know, the Emperor didn't have a manual because he didn't. Either he didn't think he was going to die, but then you get into, like, well, was this all in his plan? And. Possibly, which would make me think that actually this is also part of the plan because I still believe he's like Skee-Ball Steve from Dogma and he's just waiting for the thing to fail so he can finally release and return. Those lines. It is interesting that this book comes out on the heels of the Dawn of Fire book where the prophecy was that I have seen the man in golden chains and he is awakening well that the end of god blight <laughs> the emperor's waking up and he's waking up slowly like maybe you're right maybe he's just waiting for the throne to fail like and, and that's the other thing to consider too is like did he not create like a thing because like a user manual because he was like i'm only going to be on here for like five years and we'll get stuff fixed and it'll be fine or did he know that he's like okay this is like a light bulb it's going to sustain me for a time and then it'll burn out and I'll wake up. Um, and like the Mechanicus is artificially extending it. And like every few years, he's like, oh, please stop. Please stop. I don't, I don't know. Which to me just would make, you know, whatever conversation he had with Reboot more interesting. <laughs> Wouldn't it just... Um, I feel like if nothing else, this book and just how much they really go into that and the pieces of the throne. Like, again, we talk about how the Imperium is beset upon all sides. You can just add this to the laundry list of things that is currently messing up the Imperium. Like, oh, and by the way, the uh, the core piece of technology that allows us to travel through the warp and sustains our Lord and Savior's life. Um, it's dying. Just add that to the list. It's all. Oh, my gosh. But you're right, it added so much context to so many little conversations and, like, things that we've encountered in other books, which I always love when that happens. Which, and, you know, I, you know the throne was to hold back the the uh, webway that Magdus broke. The demons and the... Well, I did like when the so, homunculi, which brings us... In, oh, sorry. So I was, was going to say, is like, so the throne originally had this other purpose... And now it's being used for something else. So maybe that's why the core mechanism is broken. Or is, Potentially. is dying. You know, of course, you know, machinery breaks down over time as well. It's been going around for, for 10,000 years. But what cracks me up, though, is that they were all just all shocked about how much warp stuff is involved in this. I'm like, really? This... The... Per- well- the main purpose was to like hold back the broken webway and then well to hold the demons because right. the whole idea he in his grand plan he would never need the throne right. because he fixed the webway and it was perfect and we could use that um but this holds back and i did like that when the homunculi was like you don't even understand what your throne does right the throne does not sustain the emperor the throne holds back chaos like i mean it does both but right. it's primary function. right but on people don't even know that and i imagine going back to raskian's point i mean he probably would have had to spend 10 years convincing people that that's what it did and to be tbh i'm not even sure raskian fully understood that because no. the way that the like kind of tells that to Crowl is kind of like you idiots you don't even see what's going on here well i mean that's easy for an immortal race to say who's been around for a few thousand years who knows a thing or two of how it was built and and all that yes it's one thing for for them um you know but it's not like reboot even fully knew not like not like the emperor really told him probably the only person the emperor told what the throne was for is malkador like there's a reason why when horus reached the palace that the emperor was kept his ass on the throne 
He yeah. had there was and, reasons. And it wasn't until Horace like killed Sanguinius that he's just like, All right. All now right, you've maybe done it. Him down. <laughs> yes. And that it also does bring up a thing, is like what if he what if there were people, like key people who knew how the throne worked, but um one of them's Malkador. Uh, Valdor's AWOL, I'm not even going to No, we're not. Just, just no, no, yeah. nope, nope, nope. Okay. Good, nope. we're on the same page. Mm. Um, so, and then, like, I mean, what if he told, like, three other people and those people are now dead? Like, oh, there's all these... Oh, What if... Don't. What if Call knows? Oh, you know what? Part of me wonders if, like, somewhere back he's in that mind is... His... <laughs> yes. Like, part of me wonders if in the back of his brain, he's like, oh, yeah, no, I have some of that knowledge, too. Um, but because he's off doing all these other different pieces to keep I gotta go going. download that off of some server that's, I don't know, anyway. It's one of my, like, 16 personalities. Yeah. Like, um, I, so let's talk about the plan itself. Because the plan is horrible and horrifying. Um, <laughs> When I, I, all I could think of was that meme, the what? When he goes down, when Kral goes through the mirror and he's going through Kamora and he goes down and he sees the replica of the Black Throne. The what? That's bad. <laughs> right. Um, and somehow, actually, my first thought was they're going to kidnap the Emperor and put him on the throne. And then he goes back to the drop of blood and they're going to clone. I mean, that is kind of what they do. They clone, they create flesh capes, you know, flesh chairs. Somehow the plan went from bad to worse. Like, just when you thought it couldn't be any worse. Oh, we're just going to clone the Emperor, don't worry about it. But one of the things they really like... The whole time they were just like, what's going on? And Kimura has nothing to do with with this transaction. I I loved that. Like, that's neither here nor there. Oh, it's definitely here. So what about our 19 Uh, billion souls? (laughs) Uh, so going back to a point that we were just making, one of the things I found very interesting was when, when Kral reveals, right, that he's like, yeah, they made it, but it doesn't mean that they, that these people understand what it does and how it fully works. Like, or sorry, I should say they understand how it does, but they don't fully understand how it works. Like, they were missing parts. They had a little bit more knowledge than we did, obviously, but even they were missing pieces of knowledge because everything has degraded. I mean, I know that I always call the Jukari the Grey Gardens people right they are 100 percent those people with raccoons living in their ceilings although now they're <laughs> demons now there's demons in the ceilings um i cannot think of those people's i think they are bouviers uh anyways um the, the those are those people so i like the idea that yeah even you guys you smug little bastards even you've lost some information don't worry though our mechanic is general fabricator general just gave it gave you the stuff you need to know it's all good well, even then, they might know. That, I do like that. They might know that some parts of it were, you know, Eldari in nature, but it doesn't mean that that the whole thing is, or that they understand how it all fits together or anything like that. They have no idea. Well, and part of me wonders if it's. I don't know if you've ever heard the rocket analogy. I actually hate this because it gets so abused in the tech industry. But the rocket is so convoluted and so complicated and complex that no one individual can tell you how it works from start to finish. So part of me wonders if that throne technology was kind of the same too. And much like the emperor, the people who maybe did understand like certain key parts, they were killed long ago because it's the Drukhari. These are not like awesome people. Mm-hmm. Um, like maybe that's what's going on here. And the fact the fact, so at first I was like, oh man, now I'm angry that I kind of agree with Raskian. I mean, the, the Drakari part is stupid, but then once you find out, yeah, they were able to make this Black Throne because you gave them all of the information and you almost gave them the, bi- the biological material that they needed to clone the Emperor. Then I was angry all over again. And again, maybe, stepping out on a limb here, had you engaged some people from the rest of the council... Someone could have told you that. But, you know, this is a total matter of, like, you know, we get to, you know, Frank and Raskin that I know more than you do. I'm exactly. smart. And it's just, you know, and the whole time, like, the Mechanicus thought they were playing the Drukhari. Which was just... Arrogance. Which was is just, astounding. Oh, my God. In the Drukhari, usually, like, they're oozing 
arrogance. That's just what the Eldari race does to begin with. And you add some, you know, uh, chaos in there and voila, he got Drukhari. Um, so the whole time they're like, no, we know what we're doing. We're, we're smarter th than all of this. And, and even, you know, Zihas and Sivanoza were like, you have no idea what you're bargaining with here. You don't even know what you're doing. And even Crowl, it was like, I don't even have the full picture here. I just know that something is not right. I think too, though, and like, because you and I, we talk about this a lot and we use this analogy a lot, but like, we all have that stupid friend who gets excited on a solution to a problem or a thing that they need or want. And even though you're like, you know what, I don't think we fully understand this. Or have you really like, you start asking probing questions like, well, but have you looked at like how this might affect this or how this, no, this is the solution. This is the solution to my current problem. I am going to pursue this and I have blinders on. Anything that you do that tells me that this might not be the right solution, mm, I'm not going to listen to it. Right. And like, I felt like that's where Raskian was of nope, nope, right. I have, I have committed. I have decided I am in control here. I can trust these people. And yeah, if I can't trust these people, it's okay because they don't realize that I have the upper hand here. I mean, I'm a mechanicus. I've done all the calculations. Yes, you've done all the calculations towards your one biased pigeonhole solution. And if listening to true crime podcasts has taught me nothing, that's just kind of the way of things. When you're trying to solve a mystery, you will throw out everything that does not put Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody saw Scarlet walking through the house with a gun. Nope, nope, sorry. <laughs> it was a candlestick. Nobody was shot three times with a candlestick. Like, they get so yeah. fixated on this is my theory, this is my solution, this is what I'm committing to. And I felt like that was really what it was. And it pissed me off a little bit because you know that I tend to really enjoy the Mechanicus. And I got to that part and I was like, oh, Carrie's going to have a field day with this. I pretty much exemplified everything that I hate about the Mechanicus right there. It's 100% fair. And it just... Again, and I understand that this is just the, the marching orders of the Imperium is to just hate the Xenos. Like the way they talk about like Spinoza and Kral and Ziaz all just being like, ugh, whenever they would see like, ugh, we're in the webway. Ugh, why are there Eldari runes? Ugh, why are there Eldari runes on the throne? Like just this knee jerk. Oh my God. Like it's, it, it's not a good thing. To right? be I think it, fair, I think the Drukhari, because of the chaos that comes off of them, just makes everybody feel Just weird. the absolute sadism and malice that comes off of them. Yeah, that's fair. But, not only that, but they're talking about how the, these people, that the Drukhari, they're like, the hate that was coming from their eyes. Yes. That when they talked about that, I mean, like nothing about these people. But having said that, I think it could have been Reboot's big titty Eldar girlfriend, whose name just totally escaped me. Yvrain. Yvrain. It could have been her, and I think they still would have had that same, ugh. Because it's Xenos, and they've Possibly. been taught their entire life to hate them. Right? Like, that is a, that is a hard programming and conditioning to get rid of. These are I, enemies of your humanity. I just don't know if it would have been that strong. Just because it might not of the of the chaos and because of, you know, if Ravain wouldn't have had that hate or whoever in the the Eldari head of the Cabal. I can't remember his name. But he's the one who helped design the armor of fate for Reboot. We can never remember this. Man's no, name. but he didn't have that hate either. No, there. It's not necessarily chaos because remember, I mean, they all they all have an issue with chaos. Like when they talked about the demons being in Kimura, I was like, oh, that's bad like i have no sympathy for the jukari but given their whole relationship with slanesh um that's bad like that's really bad chaos is just my way of saying no i totally understand evil and in it that's what it is it's just an evil like a primordial evil that comes off these people and when he talked about like how actually this was one of the things that i really liked but also found repulsive when he talked about how they would flit between like the, their emotions would flip between just ugh to like absolute raw hatred to then something kind of vaguely amused right like this whole that was really cool because you could envision it but just when they talked about and i feel like this in every book just the malice and the hatred 
that comes off of these things. How? Well, but, I mean, I guess because I was just about to say, how did you ever trust these people? But you're Mechanicus. Right. It's, I don't, I don't, you know, honestly, the Eldari, that whole thing, just, I found it so amusing, like how hateful they are. It was like, you guys are a dying race. Like, you really have no place to be such assholes. Right. But, you know, sure. I have to, it was. It was so, one good, thing, yeah. so one thing I did, I chuckled at, even though it was like, at the end, it was like super sad. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not it. It was, uh, I think it was when, um, uh, yeah, it was when Spinoza was, 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 tr- was trying to get away and, and she was talking about how that they were, that the Drukhari were running, they were jumping all around like simians. I laughed so damn hard at that comment just because of, you know, how they always call them monkey. Uh, it's funny to me that basically all of like for them and like the Tao too because they call us the Guela. Um, how how much like racial insults are based on monkey? Uh, and yeah, when they were like they're moving like simians and stuff like that, I was like, ha, back at you, Jukari. <laughs> but they all remind me of little Edie. I had to look up her name from Grey Gardens. Like they all remind me of this character where they're just like, especially that homunculi, right? Who's like nose up in the air just talking about how your race peaked millennia ago bruh you like, guys murder fucked a chaos god a chaos being. god into existence and oh bt dubs kamora is a shithole i mean that was my biggest takeaway and probably my favorite thing though from um the karkaridan's book by um oh yeah yeah yes 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 um eduardo, eduardo yeah yeah that, that was one of my biggest takeaways is I was like, you guys live in literal squalor. Yeah. Like, and, you, and every now and then Fabius bile, bile visits and makes flush towers. Like, what? what is this place? Exactly. Like, what even is going on? And just like, even like, even your aristocracy, again, to make another great gardens parallel. If you haven't watched this documentary, please go watch this so you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, Like, She's That's talking to me, folks. Of. She knows I haven't seen it. Oh, well, I'm talking to everybody, actually. <laughs> um, you guys, if you want, like, a wild, random pop culture, it is worth the rabbit hole. Uh, it's a train wreck that you can't look away from. But it, so much of Kimura reminds me of that with these people who are like, oh, we're the aristocracy, don't you know? No, you have raccoons in your ceiling. Like, you're eating out of cans that expired 20 years ago. Y- you people are disgusting. Y- How? And again, it's because it's the Mechanicus that they looked at them and were like, mm, seems fine. Like, I-, I have no doubt that Raskin and his people never even picked up on that hatred and that malice that comes off of them. Well, no, because. That just sadism. Be- because in many, many ways, the Mechanicus, when they get rid of more human parts of them, they kind of become autistic and they can't detect emotions yeah, like this person's being sadistic okay that like i've computed and that has no bearing on what we're talking about right now i ran the numbers <laughs> right like oh my gosh so i think we can all agree though that um a clone of the emperor on a black throne in kimura would be bad okay well, that, they're, they're, they're even saying, like, it doesn't have to be a perfect clone. It could just be a lump of flesh. Like, well, you know, actually from Kamara, it would just be a lump of flesh. I mean, that just is fine. It was actually really funny because I felt like they made that argument in good faith. Like, stop being weird about it. We'll just make it a lump of flesh. Right. <laughs> that did not help your argument, friends. Like, again, just another day in Kamara. Right. Ends with a Y. These people. So, um... What happens after the events of this book? I don't know. I think we're going to actually... I Honestly, I think we're going to have to wait for the next Watchers of the Throne book. I think stuff's going to get culminated right. there. Someone needs to find I, this damn skull. Someone needs to find Gorgias, please, quickly. Um, does Arx... Do you think Arx ever learns about this? Maybe if someone finds the skull. Maybe. I do like to know... I thought that was a nice touch from Chris Wright to know 
because they'd already established earlier in the book that he records everything. Mm -hmm. So there is technically this is sitting out there. Um, it, it, it is conceivable that somebody someday will find this. The, Knowing it, our luck, it'll be an orc. When it is found, that's another voicemail to Robbie Bobby. <laughs> um, dude, I know you're busy with crusading and all, but you have to come back to Terra like now. <laughs> I don't know that that's a voicemail. I think you just deliver the file to him and don't say anything else. Like, I don't even... Because how do you even begin? How do you even begin? I honestly wonder if he might have the same theory that I, <laughs> I have. You're like, well, I already took his sword and tell him to get off his own throne and fix it himself if he's so smart. Well, but I mean, like... How, how do you begin with, like, okay, so... Three of the High Lords of Terra, they got this idea, and they definitely gave some of the throne technology to the Eldari, or to the Drakari, who, uh, by the way, were trying to make a clone of the Emperor, they're probably going to keep doing with that. Um, the Fabricator General was involved and is now dead, we lost some custodians, like, I would not want to have to be the messenger to deliver that voicemail. Oh, hell. Is that possibly why that... The call AI was like, call should be Fabricator General because all of this was going on? I have the exact same thought. And I'm actually not sure, like, in the timeline, like, where that's all, like... It's all been redone, Raskin, to be honest, anyway, so... Is Raskian out of the picture, and so they need to get another Fabricator General? They haven't named one, and that's why the call inferior is, like, Paul. Which, of course, we know that there's a whole weirdness going on there because call is like, no, it's a terrible idea. Um, but that might explain why that's such a mm -hmm. pressing issue currently, because the other one, um, I can't even talk about what the other one was doing. Um, does, does, uh, Tenau, does Tenalea find this out? Um, I can't imagine that Jukari are like, curses! Well, we'll just have to find another plan, like, de demons overrunning Kimura is, like, really bad. For whom? Well, I mean, if you're the Jukari, it's it's a less than awesome. Well, that's fine. I mean, for us, who cares? <laughs> they knew their chances when they murder fucked a god into existence. I say, let them die. Well, not only that, but they keep doing it. So... Y yes. Um... I do appreciate that, like, one side of the coin was like, no, no show no emotion we do nothing to draw her attention and the other side was like no no we're gonna do the exact opposite of that like that's a very sharp detour there isn't it um i have no idea what happens next i mean we know what happens for arcs because arcs does become one of the people that again wasn't actively working against reboot he seems okay Sure. But can you ever really trust an Inquisitor? Um, well. Oddly, oddly, one of the weird things that really lodged in my craw wrong was, for a fictional character, um, that her theory is, yeah, all of these people disappeared and Spinoza was the only person they had in common. So eventually they just write it off as, yeah, clearly the Spinoza person was corrupt and killed a bunch of people. I don't want Spinoza's name to get dragged through the mud. Even they, I think, would be I'm like, there's no way that. Spinoza could have killed nine custodians. Custodians. Or, you know, one of the things they talked about was that with, like, the rift and everything else that was going on, this is the perfect time to do this kind of stuff because all eyes are busy elsewhere. It's entirely possible that the events of this book until somebody fall, finds the skull. Mm -hmm. Get wiped under the rug. Well, it's like, I mean, stuff happens all the time, right? Stuff happens all the time. And it's a big universe. With lots of stuff. And lots of moving pieces right now. The Primarch is back. Life is changing. I don't know that anybody necessarily has... The desire to go and look this up. 
That makes me deeply sad. But surely some other Mechanicus know that the throne is failing. And they know that they've been working on it for what, what they say, 500 and something years? Or to the Emperor... How many people did Raskian tell? How many people did Raskian bring into that? Were all of the dudes that he brought in on that there? Did he upload these files somewhere? Um, like, I imagined him looking a lot like Zola from Winter Soldier. Like, do some of his hard drives get left for travel? I, I mean, that's actually... Like, it's really kind of weird to say, but I, uh, legit question. I am they? curious how he travels. If he's like a wall. Oh my god. They move it all piece by piece on grav planes. Just and his little puppet too. Ugh. Again, everything that's wrong with the Mechanicus in one book. He can't argue with you on that. Well, actually, it's actually kind of cool. No. <laughs> No, I read that whole thing and was like, hard no. Hard no. Especially when he talked about the little doll. Um, nope. I watched too many horror movies yeah. as this, a kid. No, no. Yeah. We don't need to go there. Hard path. No. The hardest of hard passes. Um. Yeah. I honestly have no idea at this point what happens. Um, I, I loved this book. I'm really sad that everyone died. Um, yeah. Thanks, and Chris. That's all I keep thinking. Thanks a lot. Why did you do? Why did you cut me so deep? Um, did you like get to the end of the book and you were like that D and D uh, DM who's just like, "That's it. Rocks falls. Everybody dies. <laughs> we're done with this campaign." He knew wonders if he's like, "Okay, I cannot have this power full of people knowing that the throne is failing." Maybe it's just too many people. It's too many loose ends that we have to tie up. Um, maybe a little bit of meta in there, a little player knowledge, not character knowledge coming in. Um, or did the powers that be tell him, we're not really going this route right now, so figure out a way to wrap it up? I hope that's not what happened. I hope not. I think it was too well written for that. I'm just throwing I would out agree ideas. With that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. But I, I don't think you're entirely wrong either. Like, that's entirely, like, I could see, like, if he came out and he was like, yeah, look, they just told me I had to get, I had to axe all of this. I would be like, oh, that makes sense. Um, I'm really glad that we read a book by an author that I really love. Yeah, have we read anything by him this year? Oh, surely we have. I say. Wait, he wrote that Space Wolf series, didn't he? Yes, yes. Okay. I think that was actually the last book we read by him. Um, uh, actually, let's see, because we're at Vaults of Terra. Oh, my God. I go back through our book list sometimes, and I'm like, all right. I forgot we read a lot of books. Um, oh, no. We read The Hell Winter Gate in November of 2021. Oh, so this is the first book we've of read the year. that we've read of his this year. Damn. Yeah, I know. Damn. Well, what yeah. are you going to do? Um, I... Because Valdor was people. also last year, yes? Wait, which one? Valdor? Valdor? Yes. Mm. Yes, it was. Okay. We read that one last year, too. Yeah, we have read way more uh, John French this year than anybody else. But, yeah, more John French than we have Chris Wright. And speaking of which... Do we have to? Yes, because we don't have another book out yet. Ah, I just threw my iPad on the floor. Oh, excellent. Yep. Um, our next book, we are going to finally finish the OG Armin trilogy. Yes, so it's Armin um, Unchanged. Bullshit. I bet he's changed. changed my book. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this. Um, I, it's like a band-aid. We just gotta pull it off at this point. Even though we swore that we weren't gonna read them, like, as closely together as we are. To your hey, earlier point... Hey, we read two books in between them. That's actually better than what we did with Fabulous Bill. Not two whole books. No, that is true. It, we're not gonna, we're not gonna build this. Um, I do wanna rip this band-aid off. 
But new books coming out this weekend. I know. Last new book coming out was Hellbricked, and I think that one's still in limited edition yeah. only. So we're waiting on that one. For you, Damien. <laughs> so we're waiting on that one, but very excited. Three new books coming out for pre order this weekend. So by the time yes. we finish this, we'll have one of those lovely things to read. So much fun. Yes. And I'm very excited for that. Um, and then we can also. <sighs> Carrie has read a lot of books that only I really wanted to read, so I'm happy to read Arm in here and get it done with. And this Again, might be the book. You bought this before I did. I know. I know. Um, I have read, like when you look at the readings, this is the best rated of these books. So I have a feeling that John French, because we see this with a lot of authors over the years, they start to come into their own and develop their own voice and get a little stronger as an author. Um, Plus, I think, you know, this is also I'm hoping. everything that we've built up with what Ariman's been doing. Yes. Hopefully. I'm hoping that this is what gives us that, like, oh, cool. So that's our next book. And then after that, hopefully we'll have some new books to dive into. And then eventually, once RMN4 comes out in hardback and or paperback and or audiobook, we can dive into that one and see what the heck he's been doing post-rip. Rift. I mean, you bought the limited edition with the, that one. I know, but I you don't even like the character. And the mirror is in my purse every day. In fact, I've used it often. Come at me. I, I think I did. I regret nothing. Okay. I don't claim to make good life choices, Carrie. I just don't want to hear more complaints. That was it. Okay. Until the next podcast. Of course. Sense, Carrie? <laughs> I suppose with that, I will. Now, you have listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding The Dark City by Chris Raitt. Be sure to join us next time for Ariman Unchanged by John French. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read for my crack. And yeah, I'm still all various. I have no like good colors. And my cat abandoned me, so I can't tell you to get some colors. You can't see chartreuse. When life gives you lemons, blood for the blood god. Sure. It's better than making lemonade. True Thanks, enough. true. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.